So we build these these landscapes of how it is that that, um, ideas are combined across the scientific literature in the past and who's combined them. And we do this by by basically creating these random walks that that move through the literature. And if you run these random walks, they end up simulating the the distribution of discoveries that are made as a function of experience that I've studied A and I've studied B so I can combine them or, or conversation that I study A and I've worked with you and you study B, and so A and B can be combined in this way. So if you run these random walks and you effectively embed them or learn them with these large transformer-style models, then you can um, uh, do a very strong job of predicting what's going to be discovered by people in the future and who's going to discover it. I I, I definitely have predicted uh, within, you know, like universities that I know, things that people are working on. And, And it's it's never that interesting in the sense that it's like they are steeped in those space of possible, you know, combinable elements. And so, you know, and so it, like it seems typically totally naturally for them. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, it's yeah. I mean, that's one of 50 things that we're studying. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> well, that's that's the one that's going <laughs> to. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. That's so cool. As you talk about that, there clearly is some excitement and an upside to that, but maybe back to this idea, is that actually problematic? Um, And if it's problematic, is it because the breakthroughs that are really going to happen are not going to happen on a predictive model? They're going to be things that were not expected to be discovered or created that actually create the biggest insights. Yeah, well, to, to be clear, so the reason we're building this, what I call a digital double of the scientific landscape, yep. is so that we can avoid it. So, so for example, we, as a result of these models of what it is that people are going to discover, um, we use this to build other AIs, which I, I think of as cultural aliens. And, um, and it turns out when we, when we test these, the predictions that these human avoiding uh, aliens generate, um, in the space of, of both, you know, like physical energy relevant materials, health related materials, um, they end up lining up uh, really powerfully against even um, first principles models of, of the properties inside these spaces. And so now we're also working with, with labs to, to, to test. And the reason is because of this diminishing marginal returns of theory. If you have a bunch of people in a part of the space, then they're then they publish the things that are successful. They don't publish the things that aren't successful. Um, so there's a whole bunch of what, what I'll call negative knowledge, which is hidden there in these in these empty spaces, these borderlands. Um, there are very few people. You know, scientists don't want to die in the forest alone if they're unsuccessful. And so there's a there's a ton of low hanging fruit um, that can be harvested by these kinds of human avoiding uh, models. But I would agree that what people tend to be doing is to bring AI into the places that they're already looking uh, and it accelerates science in that space. And then, and then we've over farmed the region. Yep. Very good analogy. Yep. <laughs> we need to move on. And um, so I think, you know, we need to spend more time building human complementary and, and kind of cultural and cognitive. I think of like alpha full two as, as like a cognitive alien, you know? So this is mm. not just, it's not, it's not just someone, uh, you know, the cultural aliens are combinations of expertise that you could form in the future. They can be held in, inside a person's mind. Alpha Fold 2, you cannot hold in any person's mind. This is a, a cognitive alien. This is an explanation that that uh, you can't compress into a and, person. And, and, I, and I love this explanation. So in almost in some ways, the alien models are helping skip what humans may find on their own even in just in time and either make it come a much faster in the example that you just gave, or actually put together combinations that very likely under current thinking would not have been created. They're putting different models together, different fields together, different discoveries together to come up with something that may never have been discovered. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when you've talked about this historically, you talk, you bring this concept of sense data for AI into the mix. What, what do you mean when you talk about sense data? I think it comes down to this, this idea uh, that von Uxel, who was a, a kind of a German um, physiologist you know, of, of the early 20th century, described as the Umwelt, 
you know, uh, so this is like kind of the, the life world, the sensory world of an animal. And his, his example was the tick. You know, the tick basically kind of, you know, measures a certain kind of acid that comes out of mammals, uh, the presence or absence of hairs that come out of mammal skin, and a certain level of heat that is that corresponds to, to basically the kinds of mammals that they like to sap blood from. And the idea is like, that's the sense, that's their sensory world. That's the, the senses that they need to basically kind of act on. And, um, you know, every animal has basically a sensory world, you know, a sensorium, like a world of, of, of vision and hearing and smell uh, and proprioception, where we understand our internal selves, which um, allows us to act intelligently in that field, basically. And so right now we have, you know, increasingly flexible and intelligent cognition, you know, in these large language, not just large language models, these deep neural networks, uh, but that, um, but we just kind of plug in a data source, you know, so it's like we, we basically just kind of plug in, you know, the videos, you know, that, um, that we've generated from some completely other space for some completely other purpose. We, we don't evolve them to maximize their capacity to act in a specific space like evolution does. And so, um, and if we look at the history of the evolution of science, we systematically see that big advances in understanding come from new technologies of sensation, right? So new measurements of otherwise or previously inaccessible, you know, wavelengths, you know, or, you know, particle sizes or whatever, this, this discriminatory capacity. And so um, if we really want AI to, uh, to allow science to see farther, we need to not just intensively apply it to the sense data that we've already gotten. If we want it to correspond yep. with any of the, the evolution of scientific advance, it's, we're going to have to use it to actively learn what to look for, you know, to build new telescopes, microscopes, and sensory devices across the space. Okay. You recently were awarded $20 million, and the, and, and the idea was to, to help build a, a, a global observatory um, that will really help cu uh, create this whole idea of models and how research is evolving year to year. Maybe I'm describing it not the best way. Tell me what that, where did that funding come from and, and exactly what is it you're planning on doing with it? So that came from the National Science Foundation okay. uh, in associated with in association with the Chips and Science Act of 2022, and um, it's in this new group called Technology and Innovation Partnerships, which has funded the other AI institutes uh, out of the National Science Foundation. And the focus of of, of our project in this um, is to predict technology advance and facilitate. Um, the U.S.'s ability to strategically fund things that would facilitate continued innovation and leadership globally inside this space. And so the, our, our problem, as we understand it, is to kind of build predictive models that take into account policies, the distribution of, of inventive and discovering scientists and engineers, uh, and, and the kind of like competitive landscape of firms that are producing technologies to predict when and how it is that performance advances uh, occur in critical technology areas. Okay. And, um, and I'll be honest, I think that the most, um, uh, the most successful things that these models that we're building can do is not just see further because, you know, people who are present at the frontier of certain areas of, um, you know, semiconductors, uh, they understand many of the things that are likely to kind of occur in the future. The things that are the biggest, as you say, um, the biggest achievements of human discovery are the things which were unexpected. And so right. what I think is really powerful, and this has to do with that analogy question you were asking earlier, that I think that these models will enable us to do, is, um, is when the models are tuned to see the scientific frontier the same way that the full distribution of individuals see it. And when surprising papers or patents or products emerge, hmm. surprising, which is, you know, we, we didn't expect them to come. They happened as a result of, of some unexpected combination of sensation and theory that, you know, that, that made this thing or, or made this thing visible. Um, then we can put those into the model 
And because of the rich internal geometry of the model, we can say, okay, this improbable thing becomes extremely probable. What are all the other things in the geometry of the model that were improbable five minutes ago that are now hmm. much, much more probable? I think that will be a unique and novel capability for government, uh, for industrial funding of technology. So it's kind of like, what are all the entailments, you know, if, you know, if this particular material has this energy level, if this, you know, if this particular therapeutic works against this undruggable cancer, like what are all the other mm. things that now are very likely to be true as a result of that thing being true? I think that will be, uh, so th I think that's, that's one of the, the, uh, the core um, targets that, that we're uh, hoping to achieve.